All right. Uh, welcome to the uh, four o'clock session on the second day of a conference. I'm happy that you all made it here. This is a really cool space. Uh, wave if the sun gets to the point where you can't see the TVs and you need us to do a little more proactive reading of the screen. Uh, but I'm Matt Butcher. I'm the CEO of Fermion. Uh, this is Chris. And I'm Chris Madison. I run sales and solution engineering here at Fermion. And uh, today we're going to talk about WebAssembly, uh, serverless AI, how these things kind of work together. Uh, Chris will talk a lot about what WebAssembly is, why it's promising for this kind of next wave of cloud computing. Then I'll uh, show a little bit of TypeScript code uh, that does an LLM inferencing call, and we'll play around with that, have some fun, and then kind of end up talking a little bit about uh, how we use Sivo's GPUs and the whole Deep Green project, which is something we're really enthusiastic about. Uh, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Thanks, Matt. Cool. So let's kind of dive into the quick overview of who we are. We'll get to the tech. All right. So uh, Butcher and a bunch of our founders came out of Microsoft, uh, where they were investigating uh, how to go build a better Kubernetes ecosystem. All right. And really came to understand that, well, Kubernetes, we incrementally made make it better. There's lots of things about this that it seems like there could be another way another thing and really started investigating could functions be that next thing and so azure obviously had azure functions there but there's a lot of shortcomings in terms of the speed at which it could execute uh as well as the cost of what you could get there and then you know your ability to do that somewhere else in a portable way and really looking around like is there a better serverless functions that we could create and well we wanted to do a bunch of things right it support a ton of different languages it should be secure by default it should run anywhere we want, and it should be super fast and efficient. And the looking around at the different technologies, it saw WebAssembly as this thing that was built for the front end, and really it was like, hey, it has all these features, right? It has a sandbox. It is super small. It supports a bunch of languages. It wasn't intended for this use case, but maybe we can build a company and you know, build a team to go make it do that. So at well, the sub Microsoft started created the Bytecode Alliance with Microsoft and Amazon and Fastly and much others, and then Fermion as we uh, became a company, about how do we go take WebAssembly and go run that on the back end. Right? And so we can see this kind of this evolution of how we've evolved. Uh, you know, we've, we think of this thing moving on a long time from, hey, I built this thing physically, to VMware comes along and I have virtual machines, to now Docker's like, hey, we could use these containers that have been in here to do something more interesting. Right? what's the next wave of this look like, right? And just like containers didn't replace virtual machines and virtual machines haven't replaced every use case for bare metal, right? This isn't to say that like everything will change and be WebAssembly tomorrow. This is that we've really found that like with each of these layers, what well, the abstraction gave us some new advantages, it gave us some new abilities that it unlocked and enabled us to go do things we couldn't have done before. Uh, but still there's certain niches where it makes the most sense. And you really see here is trying to visualize what is happening. And this is the, the, really the domain of what I as a developer need to care about. Right? So if I'm building this app on a bare metal system, right? I need to care about the operating system. I need to care about everything from the ground up, basically, to do this. Moving things to virtual machines really gave us that flexibility of like, hey, I can have as ops, I can have a bunch of big virtual machines or a bunch of big uh, servers, and then carve those up into virtual machines that match the size of the application I need. But now it's still on the team to make sure we have the appropriate operating system, utilities, and all that stuff installed. Docker again simplified this for us uh, and made this so it was easier and more portable. But we still have to care about uh, you know, what the, the flavor of the Docker image that you have, what utilities that are in there. And then you know, if there's a vulnerability in one of those upstream libraries that happens to be in your image, right? now we need to think about how do we get all of these images updated, rebuilt, all these security concerns. So we just by doing this, we still add all these concerns that are not what you want your developers to be doing at the end of the day, is spending their time writing the application that actually makes your company money and moves the needle for your company. Uh, and so how can we abstract away as many of these things as possible? Right? And that's where the power of WebAssembly is. We'll look here. and. Uh, we'll show live and we'll see it uh, in a few more of these slides. What we've really done is get you to the point where the only code that we're going to be shipping around, the only artifact that you really care about, is going to be comprised of byte code that is just a transformation of the code that your actual developers wrote. 
You don't have to worry about the operating system. You don't have to worry about, is this Intel or is this x86? You don't really need to think about all of these things that we really required people historically to think about as developers that slow them down and trip them up and cause issues. Let's focus just on the bare minimum of what needs to be done. And that's really where it becomes the enabling technology of, wow, now my developers can go build code a lot faster. They can do it in a safer way. I don't have to worry about all of these dependencies that I brought in adding additional risk. So let's talk about the problems that they were saw originally when they were looking at why Azure Functions kind of do, the, do this, right? So if we look at AWS Lambda or Azure Functions, like with Lambda, they're using Firecracker. Azure Functions, I believe, are using containers, right? They've got some kind of isolation methodology. But a lot of this startup time, like the, we've got the cold starts of, you know, three, 500 milliseconds, even warm, like 200 milliseconds. The best you're going to get is with the unofficial Rust down to about like 30-ish milliseconds. Startup time warm for Rust and Lambda. But what essentially the problem you have is they have all these firecracker virtual machines. And every combination that you can pick of like what version of Python or what version of Rust that you want to have supported and what uh, underlying architecture, uh, is that Ubuntu or uh, CentOS or whatever, like those all need to be little virtual machines that they have running somewhere, right? And when you, your code gets hit and launches, they have to go find the appropriate one, copy your code to that, and then run it in there. And then with Lambda, they'll continue to send requests to that, so it'll be warm for a while. With Azure, they end up killing it, and you pay that same penalty all over again. Right? So that really becomes a problem. There's so many different options, and you have to copy the data around to get it. You really can't avoid this startup time of a couple hundred milliseconds. Shopify did a study a few years ago that is about 300 milliseconds. You start losing customers. If your website is like, they click a box, and your site's not responsive, about 300 milliseconds, some of those people are going to start going to another tab. And you're going to start losing sales because of it. So you think if I've got 200 milliseconds of startup time, there's a lot of tasks that we just can't do as serverless. And we just have to rule out as this can't be solved because it's going to be too slow when you add that with every other bit we're going to get latency from. Right? And then we have the problem of containers being really expensive. Right? So uh, there's, uh, we had a talk that uh, was given by one of, our, uh, one of our engineers, Kate, about this, this whole problem of mean or peak to mean. Right? And the closer we can have our peak and our mean together in terms of our utilization, generally the better we can utilize resources because we don't have to massively over provision for a peak that we're not using most of the time because our mean or average isn't anywhere close to that. Right? And so Butcher was talking to a data center uh, manager at Azure and still at Microsoft about like what's this guy's main problem? And like, he can't and the guys it can't build these data centers fast enough, right? It can't get the real estate. I can't get the servers, I can't get the cooling, I can't get all this built. But these things are all running at 20% utilization. Because the technologies that we use between virtual machines and containers encourages us to always be massively over-provisioned. Right? Like, and if I have the, the time it takes for me to go start up the new virtual machine, I need to be starting that before I'm using it here. Or start up a new container, or start up a new VM under the host. I have to have that start early enough that it's up by the time my load spikes. And so I've always over vision. And then when I'm going down on the other side, we're going to generally keep these things up because we don't know is the workload going to come back up. Now they've already paid the startup penalty, we are encouraged to keep it around for a long time so that we don't pay another startup penalty for it. So by doing this, we always end up spending more money than we otherwise would. And then, of course, there's other restrict restrictions. If you look at Kubernetes, we get about like 256 pods on a node, I think is a limit. But like really more in production, we're seeing 20 to 50 that people are going to put on there because they have so much overhead of just those containers and some limitations of those containers that prevent you from better utilizing that node and packing things in denser. And this is just another visualization that really kind of shows you the way to think about this. Right? Like again, in terms of I'm going to ship around a container, the scope of that is going to be you know, generally a couple hundred megs. It's a pretty normal container. But the vast majority of that is not the code that your team wrote. It's not the services that you really care about. The vast majority of it is all of the things that you have to ship around that that your system requires to support it. So we are serverless functions. We've got two different things that we offer. So Spin is our open source tool. 
right? You can go take advantage of that right now, go use it anywhere we want, deploy stuff locally. The nice thing, unlike Lambda or Azure Functions, where developing locally is very difficult, developer experience is one of our first things out of the gate. So we're like, how can we make this be awesome? I want to make sure that you can locally just go spin new. I'm going to create an application with this template, and it's working. I can go spin up, and I can see it working locally. We have resources, which we'll talk about, like KV and database. We'll make all those work locally. And so you have that full development experience local. I can do what I expect to do. OK, now I need to put this in production. And I'm not going to put a production running off my laptop, so i got to go put it somewhere. Uh, and one of the other things we offer is Fermion Cloud, which is you can go deploy to us. And so one of the, the slogans we had for a long time in the company was, uh, was 66 seconds. And I think it was we can go from an empty terminal to an app deployed on the internet with a DNS address, address live in a minute, right? Because we make that easy enough to throw a template up and have a place to go send that, and it's going to go load. Uh, so Fermion Cloud is intended. So we've got a, a large uh, free tier, uh, 100,000 invocations a month, more than you're probably going to do for any kind of side project. Uh, and then there's a paid tier with Ultimately, the goal is that if you were going to use this at a really high level, uh, it ended up being a bit cheaper than uh, something like a Lambda would be. Uh, but that said, we expect a lot of the users, and the users we've seen so far really adopt this. You know, it's, a little, it's startups, and it's people's personal projects and side projects and uh, personal pages and whatnot. So we see a lot of that PLG kind of growth happening there. And then the next place, we'll talk about this a bit more, is kind of our, been our Kubernetes focus and how we can go offer all of the same stuff in your Kubernetes. So spin, I kind of talked through this. These are some of the features of spin. So one of the things we're going to talk about a bunch here is going to be our serverless AI. Uh, so that, I guess that probably doesn't need a new logo anymore. That's about six months old now, uh, which I think is old in the tech world. But uh, we built, so when we built this, right, we built, cool, we've got serverless functions. You take a request in, you get a request out. If I need to modify some JSON or something like that, which a lot of Lambda functions out there are doing something like that, that was the first thing we made work. But it turns out that a lot of apps are more complicated than that, right? And they need some kind of state. They need a bunch of other services. Uh, and there's the ability. So for some of these, we had host binding. So I can go talk to Postgres, or I can go talk to these other services like Redis out there. But one of the things we want to do is really start changing how people build applications. And so we looked at, like, can we build an interface so that you say, like, here's a KV or here's a database. Let me write to this and let me read to this. And as a developer, you don't have to think about what is the actual implementation of that underneath the hood. When you run it locally, you know, we we'll, might do that in SQLite. If you push that up into the cloud, like, your, if you push it to Fermion Cloud, we'll use a SQLite service like Terso to go do that. If you push it to Kubernetes, your operations should be able to decide, like, this is the database that's used. No code changes. It just works. And so by building these interfaces, we make all of this faster and easier to develop and safer to move these things around. So we really get in the, uh, the sort of the no ops approach of, let's just make it so developers can just do what they need to write, build what the apps they need to build, and then operations can figure that out. Or if operations doesn't exist, they can just send it to, the cloud, to our cloud, and it'll just work. Uh, serverless AI is one of the most recent renditions, and I'll let uh, Matt get a little deeper into that. But again, offering things like large language models inferencing, we just built that in and made that super easy and super efficient. So for me on cloud, I talked a bit about, again, we have the same full stack apps, super easy and fast to deploy. So just kind of showing you what's going on here, right? So I've got my spin application here, where, which, no, this side. I'm trying to do this mirror image. Uh, it's my spin application. We have a spin.toml. We'll show you that. That defines what you can do. With WebAssembly, everything is deny first, right? Like, unlike other tools where you say, like, forced in a uh, security layer afterwards, this was designed to be in the browser with a bunch of untrusted code. Uh, so it was designed to be secure. So you have to say what you're going to allow and what your, co your components are and how it matches together. And you've got your language. Uh, if you're using a AI, you can do that locally and call that out here. Uh, and then we've got services like key value, et cetera. And then you push that out to the cloud or to, uh, to Kubernetes. Like You'll go run your application up in the cloud. We'll handle supporting all the same services. 
And then again, we're at Siva Navigate. We use Siva for uh, the cloud compute. All right, so this is really all the hero slides back as we talked about the problem slides. All right, you see here in this example, we're going to take the, we still take the same amount of time to run the code. Right, like you wrote your code as efficiently as you did in whatever language you did. That takes 50 milliseconds, whatever is going to take 50 milliseconds. Uh, but we've eliminated the startup time. Right? And we, the cool thing about this is we've done this on all of the languages we support. So if you, for instance, are using Python and you type like Python 3 main.py, it's going to take about a second to do anything because it's going to load up the uh, interpreter, it's going to load up your code, and then it's going to start. With us, we actually, once we convert this into WebAssembly, we run it through this little trick called Wiser, where we pre-initialize the thing up to the point of the first input, and that's what we actually store and are able to use. So that's why we get to set, like, again, we're faster than Python would be if you just ran it locally because of that. So I think about how we optimize this, right? Again, optimize for your abilities. Your demand goes up, your demand comes down. Every single request we can service as it comes across. And I like to think about this again, like uh, just more visualizations of what we're doing here. As you think about that earlier slide I had with like the sort of the, the planetary or the, like the electron orbits, right? Where you had the, your app in the middle and then the kernel and the drivers and libraries and all the other things that you needed, right? Like all that heft that comes along that heft limits how much you're going to be able to go put into any single node. If you take out a lot of that heft, you get a lot more stuff into the node. And the consequence of this density, of course, is going to be on cost savings. So, and that's, again, cool little hero slide. We're popping the app, like your app, out of all of that. And it's just your app, like your code and spin. Cool. So that was the... The basics, the overview here, you know, we didn't get into even some of the new cool component model and other stuff that we're doing, but I think this sets us up for what we wanted to talk about now of the AI. Last couple of things I wanted to mention first that you may would be interested in looking at. Uh, we've got a white paper on AI cost optimization. So if you want to go read more about that, uh, you can go download that from our website as we talk about like how to actually do this at scale and in an inexpensive way. Yeah, I'll let him take this picture, and then I'll hit next slide. <laughs> cool. And then uh, our quick start, always the great best place to get started. Again, you should be able to up, be up and running very quickly. And now I will turn it over to Butcher. Yeah, so, uh, you know, again, kind of recapping the main things that Chris pointed out that we really were attracted to about WebAssembly, right? So WebAssembly is a bytecode format. It is secure. It supports a wide variety of languages. It's cross-platform and cross-architecture, which means you can build it on Windows, Intel, run it on Linux, ARM, and nobody has to make any changes at all to the code, right? Uh, a great thing, actually, when you're in the cloud and you want to choose the cheapest architecture, you don't have to push that constraint back to the developers and say, hey, we switched from Intel to ARM. We need you to go rebuild these containers or these images. Uh, but uh, again, so it's like um, the security, the performance, the portability and the cross architecture, cross platform, those are the strengths of WebAssembly. So, you know, we started looking at what was going on in the AI ecosystem. Uh, as LLMs really got popular last year, we were looking at it not necessarily as a, as a problem of, of AI computing or a problem of training or building large models. We were looking at it through the same lens we were looking at serverless. How is this a compute problem? because essentially AI requires huge amounts of compute. It's somewhat specialized compared to the other kinds of compute we were used to talking about a couple of years ago, but it still requires this kind of uh, efficiency to capture a resource, use it to its fullest, and then free it up as soon as possible. But in the sort of first early generation of AI inferencing we were seeing, uh, applications were locking a GPU for the entire time the application was running because they needed to be able to use it on demand without having to wait for something else. So we were seeing a lot of environments where uh, a containerized application would start up and then it would pick its GPU or its fractional GPU and hold on to that GPU for days or weeks or even months because it was a long running process. And so in a sense, 
the GPU was sitting idle for a long amount of time, very similarly to the way Chris was pointing out CPUs sit idly in the Azure Data Center, which is kind of the thing that got us going on this whole WebAssembly thing. So we, st we looked at this uh, LLM inferencing problem and said, this is a compute problem. How do we get more efficient? I just realized I'm wearing sunglasses. How do we get more efficient in the way that we're using GPU compute, just like we've been trying to do using CPU? So if your application is only running for a couple of milliseconds to a minute, as you do with a serverless function, then you know for a fact that function only needs that GPU for the period of time it's running. It turns out actually with WebAssembly, we can get even more specific and say it only needs the GPU when the WebAssembly runtime gets the signal that it's about to run an LLM inference. And so we can actually get to the point where we say inference starts, schedule me a GPU. I'm going to run this inference. The millisecond is done. I'm going to free back up that GPU and another function can use it. And consequently, we can get that same kind of curve shape that, that Chris showed, where, every, where the little blocks fit perfectly under the curve because you can schedule very, very efficiently. And so that's how we approach this problem. Uh, and it, it, you know, after I show a little bit of code here, I'll come back to it and tell you, you know, how how we use Sivo's GPUs and Deep Green's GPUs to accomplish this, uh, because they have some cool technology that we got to take advantage of. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over, and we're gonna look at a little serverless function that does some LLM stuff. So, uh, can you come hold the microphone for me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm bad enough typing with two hands. You don't want to see me try it with one. So this is a very small TypeScript application. This is a complete serverless function. So you know, I, I import a couple of libraries here out of the spin core library. Um, I create a couple of a couple of things, but this is the main one. So if you're not used to looking at a TypeScript function, uh, this is a function declaration in TypeScript. The function's name is handle request, and it takes a request object and it returns a response object. So this is kind of the way that serverless functions work, right? You're, you're handling an event. There's no long running server. So this uh, program is started up when a request comes in, given that request object, does its processing, spits back out the response and shuts down and those resources are freed back up again. So this is, you know, this is our main entry point here. We're not gonna do too much. We're gonna try and build a little application that does sentiment analysis on text. Uh, we're going to get a little creative here because it's hard to, it's, it's ugly to demo this stuff all in curl. So uh, we're going to get a little bit creative and we're actually going to create a couple different components, or I already created a couple different components. Uh, this is the sentiment analysis code that we just looked at. Uh, I also have a file server on here that is just a serverless function that spits out files. And all the file that it's going to serve is an index.html file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up that index. Uh, start up the server, pull up that index. We're going to run one of these inferences locally on my machine. And then I'm going to talk through the code because it's going to take so long to run the inference locally that we've got to fill the space somehow. Uh, where is my warp terminal? There we go. Let's do this all in VS Code. Okay, so I've got my code up, up above here. I'm just going to build... So I'm going to run the spin command uh, to build, and I'm going to do dash dash up, which will also start me a local server. So Chris was talking about how we start up a JavaScript environment, load all the scripts into it, and begin the execution of that JavaScript environment, and then freeze and package that as the WebAssembly. So we skipped over all the initialization steps of a JavaScript runtime like Node, where you usually start Node and you wait a second or so. So that's how we get this sort of like one millisecond startup time. We sort of pre-initialize this. So as soon as it starts up, it's going to invoke my handle request function. It's already got all the scripts loaded. So first thing up, uh, we're going to take a look at this really, really pretty web environment here. <laughs> it's like Yield Bootstrap from uh, 2006, the last JavaScript framework, or last CSS framework I've learned. Uh, let's say uh, it is a lovely day. And I'm going to ask the Llama 2 model that's running locally to run an inference and tell me whether or not it is a lovely day is positive in sentiment, negative in sentiment, or neutral. So I'm going to click on this. Now it tells me that it's waiting for the llama to go through and process all of this. Uh, so locally, I'm running the 7 billion parameter llama model. Uh, and those of you used to LLMs are going, OK, 7 billion, that's a small model. Uh, the rest of us are like, billion, how many zeros is that? So that's running in the background here. 
And uh, I'm going to leave that kind of sitting out down there so I can see it. So here's our code, right? So when I ran that, it called this handle request function, uh, grabbed the request body and did its little decoding of the uh, URL encoded text or uh, URL post encoding. And then it took a prompt. So our LLM is being prompted. Uh, and I'm telling the LLM, okay, you're a bot that generates sentiment analysis responses, respond with a single positive, negative, or neutral. Okay, so I'm telling it what it's doing, and then I'm going to give it a couple examples. Hi, my name is Bob, is neutral. Uh, I'm so happy today is positive. I'm so sad today is negative. So I'm trying to tell it how I expect its responses to be. Uh, and then I'm, then I'm saying, okay, I'm done with my system prompt. Uh, give me a user sentence, and we'll pop it right in there, and we'll run it. So... I'm using the llama2 chat model. I'm going to run this LLM infer command, and I'm going to pass it the model, and I'm going to pass it the prompt, which is that chunk of text we just looked at, plus the sentence that I just sent, which was, it's a lovely day out here today. And then it's going to sit here, and it's going to churn for a while as it eats up all of my CPU, because I'm running a CPU-based inference. And then it's going to refer, uh, return back a JSON uh, piece of content which is going to be picked up by this very, very bad, because I'm not a good browser-side developer, JavaScript that's going to run the inference, populate some fields, and stuff like that. So uh, in other words, fairly, fairly basic client-server style app. So let's see. OK, the llama has spoken now, so let's see. Uh, it is a lovely day was the text that I entered, and the bot came back and said that's positive sentiment. So. I did that and ran it in the background because on my CPU, which is an M1 ARM-based CPU, it takes a very long time to do an inference like that. Uh, usually, we don't want to ask our users to wait for three, five, ten minutes to get a response back from a web application. And that's one of the reasons why we need these massive AI-grade GPUs, right? like the A100, H100, that style of GPU. Uh, so, you know, Chris talked about how we got Spin, the local developer tool. We've got Fermion Cloud, the kind of hosted uh, Fermion environment. And, uh, and, and that one also has support for LLM inferencing. However, that one is backed by AI-grade GPUs. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to deploy this same exact application. Uh, and I'm going to just do Spin Deploy. That's the only command I need. I don't have to rebuild anything. And it's going to deploy that up to... Uh, and tell me I didn't uh, do my login, huh? Oh, did I lose my network? I lost my network. Please hold. OK, there we go. Uh, that may be that may be the case. So let me see if I can bypass that and go to the version that I cleverly deployed before, and of course is not in my browser history. Imagine a fast LLM response. <laughs> uh, what was the name of this? Uh, OK, what was the sentence I used? Uh, it is a lovely day outside. And there we go. That's not quite instantaneous, but close enough that we, we see that response come back fairly quickly. Let's try a negative sentence. Um, I'm sad that I don't know why I'm bothering selling Sibo Navigate right. Uh, about to end. And I'll run that. Toast is bland. I got a negative one on that one. Um, how about this guy is blue? That should be neutral. Uh, it's positive for some reason. But we can kind of see there right away, right? In that first inference, it took three to five minutes to run. Now we're getting it going, you know, like nearly instantaneously. We can run many. Uh, so that's, you know, we've, we've essentially taken just a small bit of code here. Uh, some total of the uh, index.ts is, I think, under 50 lines. Yeah, 46 lines of, of TypeScript code and built our first little llama-based inferencing uh, uh, engine here just using that one function that is part of the WebAssembly runtime and spin. 
that does uh, LLM.infer. Okay, so what's going on behind the scenes? The first thing to notice is that when I was running locally, I was using CPU-based inferencing. But when I was running remotely, I was running GPU-based inferencing. If you've done much coding in this ecosystem, you know that typically that's a fairly major change you make in the, in the libraries you choose, in the way that you're, you're building your application. Because we're compiling to WebAssembly, which is platform neutral, and because we're the driver is part of the spin runtime itself and the driver understands this underlying architecture, the WebAssembly code doesn't need to know anything about the inferencing environment in which it's running. It can be a CUDA architecture, it can be a metal architecture, it can be a CPU-based architecture. This, the WebAssembly doesn't need to know about that. So that binary is CPU portable, operating system portable, and also GPU portable. So we can take that same application and, and install it and run it in a bunch of different places. Now, the second thing to notice is, first of all, I was getting pretty fast response times on that. I was running that against the production Fermion cloud that thousands of other applications are also running on, and still I was getting performance like that. And I was running on the free tier of Fermion Cloud on top of that. Uh, so this is basically the baseline performance that you can get out of an environment like that. And the reason why is because, again, I'm only claiming the GPU while I'm sending that string to it and the LLM is interpreting it and then I'm getting my response back and then free up the GPU. So hundreds and hundreds of applications can share the same GPU and still have that sort of like, you know, 50 millisecond, 100 millisecond response time because uh, it, it's, it's just very efficient in the way that it handles its resources. So. How do we do that? So what's going on on the Fermion cloud side? And we could go back to that diagram, but if you remember that diagram, we had sort of the Sivo GPUs down here in the bottom side. We are essentially using a, a small scheduler to schedule usage on a GPU, much the same way that something like Kubernetes schedules um, uh, uh, pods onto different nodes. We're just scheduling inferences onto a GPU, and you need the model, and you need the inferencing strings you need, and you need the connection back to the application. And so that little tiny piece of code that does that scheduling manages to queue things up, push things through a queue as fast as it possibly can, and get things returning back and, and scheduling out the GPUs we use. So we use three GPUs total. So we've got three A100 serving you know, approximately 3,000 users. Uh, and now, of course, not all of them are doing AI and not all of them are, are using inferencing all the time, but that's the kind of scale that we've sort of seen on this. We can we see about a couple hundred applications per GPU seems to be just fine, and that's about as much as we ever see moving through at the same time. Now, the interesting thing about these GPUs is they are A100s, but they're running in deep green. How many of you have, have seen or heard the, the, the deep green story? Um, so uh, this is the, one of the coolest things that I think Sivo has done. They partnered with Deep Green. Uh, Deep Green uh, is dedicated to kind of a sustainable way of managing GPU architectures. So what they do is they take a bank of GPUs and they mount them in a kind of rack that looks to me a lot like a refrigerator <laughs> on its side, and they fill it with mineral oil, and they execute these things in here. So what's the number one problem we have when we're dealing with waste from GPUs? It's heat. They generate so much heat during inferencing that we tend to do things like liquid cooling these things to try and get the heat dissipated as fast as possible. Okay, so here's another problem space that the deep green folks were interested in. How do you make heating water more efficient? You know, you can use gas to heat it, electricity to use it, and so on. Uh, and they kind of took these two together and said, what if we take the output of the, the, the undesirable waste output of GPU processing and use it as the energy source for heating large bodies of water? And by large, I mean like swimming pool sized or condo building sized uh, water heaters and things like that. So, uh, so Mark, Mark Bjorn's guy, who is the CEO of, um, of Deep Green, posted recently on his LinkedIn that Fermion's GPUs heat a swimming pool somewhere in the UK. Uh, and they've got this community center with a bank of GPUs that we use, and the heat byproduct of that manages to heat the pool. Uh, th the cool thing about it is those were the GPUs we were hitting. So we were seeing the performance of that real time. And even though we were making a round trip to the UK and back you know, on my phone's uh, LTS service here, we still, LTE service, we still saw a pretty good response time for that. 
So this is, I, I love telling this story because I think it is such an interesting way to analyze some of the problems that we create, right? We want to get to more efficiency because efficiency means cutting cost. Efficiency means improving performance. Efficiency also in this case means improved sustainability, right? We're taking a waste product and we're reusing it in an environment where otherwise we'd have to use electricity or gas or something like that to generate that same kind of power. So I, I just think it's a really awesome way to do things. So, uh, you know, to kind of wrap up here, then we started out Chris started out by talking about what WebAssembly is why we got really invested in this serverless problem in the first place again an efficiency story how do we make serverless programming easy for the developer but also drive down the cost uh, drive up the efficiency and be able to scale as close to instantly as we possibly can right one millisecond uh, and then we went from there into talking about, you know, spin the open source development tool uh, that you can go download today from developer.fermion.com slash spin and try it out and build WebAssembly binaries in Python, in TypeScript, in Go, in Rust, and in some other languages. And then we talked a little bit in the first part about Fermion Cloud and how we built this hosted platform that, again, part of this is on Sivo, and, uh, and use that to sort of make it super easy for a developer to deploy an application that uses key value storage database needs to map a domain or needs to do serverless AI uh, and then finally you know we looked at what these serverless AI applications look like we had a 46 line program that did some sentiment analysis and we saw how we could kind of run it locally at a little bit of a cost in terms of time and then deploy it out there and run it on these deep green GPUs somewhere in the UK and still get these nearly instantaneous responses uh, so with that uh, thank you very much for